Welcome. This video is going to take a look at the Try One Final, covering chapters 1 to 4 in the IB book. And as you can see on the top of my key here, there were 14 multiple choice questions or paper 1 questions, and then 23 marks on the paper 2 questions. So starting with the multiple choice, question 1 wants to know what is the total number of ions present in the formula Al2SO4-3? So they're not asking how many ions are in a mole, just how many ions are here. Well, Al is one ion, it forms a plus 3 ion, and SO4, sulfate, is my other ion at minus 2. So that means I have a total of 2 plus 3, or 5 ions, being represented by that formula. Number 2 says, 3 decimeters cubed, or 3 liters of sulfur dioxide, is reacted with 2 liters of oxygen according to the equation below. What volume of sulfur trioxide is formed? Well, remember, because these are all gases, Avogadro's law says they all have um, the same number of particles per liter. So you could either convert these to moles, although you really can't because you don't know the pressure and volume. But remember, your molar ratio is actually your liter ratio since they're all gases. So looking at how much SO3 each one could produce, the three moles or the three liters of sulfur dioxide uh, produce a one-to-one -one ratio or two-to-two -two ratio, so it would also produce three liters of SO3. But the two liters of oxygen only produ uh, produce twice as much. They produce two SO3 per one liter of oxygen, so they would actually produce four. So that means we're limited by the SO2 to just three liters of SO3. Number three says Avogadro's constant has the same value as the number of Molecules in one mole of solid iodine. That seems like it would be one because a molecule of solid iodine, one mole would only have one mole of molecule. Solid iodine comes in molecules. Atoms in one mole of chlorine gas, that's not one mole, that's two moles because there's two chlorine atoms per molecule of chlorine gas, so two moles in chlorine gas. Ions in one mole of solid potassium bromide, that's got two ions in it, a positive and a negative one, so that's also going to be two moles. And protons in one mole of helium gas, and if you look at helium, it's number two, so it's got two protons per mole. So only A is truly one mole of uh, molecules in the solid iodine. Number four asks, a fixed mass of an ideal gas has a volume of 800 under certain conditions. If the pressure and temperature are both double, doubled, what is the volume of the gas after these changes with the other conditions? Well, I know that the relationship is P times V over T, so if I double P and I double T, those, equa those uh, differences are going to cancel out, and so I should have the same volume or 800 centimeters cubed after the changes. Number five says, which statement is generally true about the melting points of substances? One, melting points are higher for compounds containing ions than for compounds containing molecules. That's true. Ionic bonds are typically much stronger than covalent bonds, so higher melting points. A compound with a low melting point is less volatile than a compound with a high melting point. That's not true because volatile means it easily changes or vaporizes, so low melting point would be more volatile. Three, the melting point of a compound is decreased by the presence of impurities. That's true. When we talked about freezing point depression, when you put sand or salt on the road, it gets in the way of water freezing, and so that would be true as well, meaning B, one and three only. Number six, which is the correct description of polarity in F2 and H2? Well, each of these is just a single bond. I've got F2 single bonded to itself and HF single bonded to each other. But F2 is going to be a nonpolar bond and therefore a nonpolar molecule. But HF is going to be both a polar bond and a polar molecule because fluorine is very polar. And because there's just two atoms, it is definitely going to pull the electrons toward the fluorine, creating a negative end and a positive end. So out of those statements, only D is true. One of the molecules is polar. Number seven, which species has 54 electrons and 52 protons? Well, the 52 protons identifies it as tellurium. Only tellurium contains 52 protons. The 54 electrons lets me know it's picked up two extra electrons, which would be a minus two charge. So the only one fitting that description is A. 
Number eight, which statement is correct for the emission spectrum of hydrogen atoms? The lines converge at lower energies. No, the lines always converge at the higher energies. Remember, the greatest step is from the nucleus to one, and then one to two, two to three. The steps are getting closer and closer. The lines are produced when electrons move from lower to higher energy levels. No, that's when energy is put in. The energy is released when the excited electrons move back toward ground state. The lines of the visible region involve electron transitions into the energy level closest to the nucleus. No, there's a UV, a visible, and an infrared spectra. So the UV would have the highest energy or the level closest to the nucleus. And D, the line corresponding to the greatest emission of energy is in the ultraviolet region. That is the true statement. Number nine asks, which of the pro following properties of the halogens increase from fluorine to iodine? So this is group 7A. It's our smallest, most reactive nonmetals, with fluorine being the smallest in the upper right and then energy levels being added. So one, atomic radius, yes, that does increase as you move down any family. Two, melting point, yes, for nonmetals, it increases as more electrons are available for London dispersion forces to occur in. Three, electronegativity, no, that would decrease as the size increases, there'll be less attraction by the nucleus for a shared pair. So B, one and two only. Number 10 was a little bit tricky. A lot of you chose D, one, two, and three, because you remembered that nonmetals tend to produce acetic solutions. But the catch here was SiO2, remember, forms this giant covalent bond. It's what we usually think of as quartz or glass, and that doesn't dissolve in water. So it's not going to produce any kind of solution because it's not going to dissolve. So only two and three will produce acetic solutions. Number 11 wants to know which substance is most similar in shape to NH3. Well, the only one in the same family as nitrogen is phosphorus. And so... Um, Iodine, fluorine, chlorine, they're all halogens, so the ratio should only be the same um, between phosphorus and nitrogen, should have the same ratio with a halogen or hydrogen. Number 12, which molecule is nonpolar? So I just sketched them out. H2CO uh, has carbon double bond to oxygen with the two hydrogens, so that's definitely polar. Don't have the three, three same atoms attached. SO3 has got three oxygens bonded. Even though one is double bonded, remember that resonance means that that double bond is going to be equally distributed. So that is going to be nonpolar. Those uh, oxygen atoms are going to be equally distributed around. NF3 is going to have a lone pair, making it a polar molecule. And CHCl3, again, we don't have four identical atoms around it. So even though it has a tetrahedral structure, it is going to be polar. Number 13, which molecule is linear? Again, you just had to sketch them out. And if you sketch them out, you see all but CO2 have lone pairs uh, bending the shape. So only B, CO2, is linear. Number 14, according to Vesper theory, repulsion between electron pairs decreases in the order. Remember, lone pair have no nuclei restricting their movement, so they take up the most space or create the most repulsion, whereas bond pair have the most restricted movement. So it's going to be A, lone pair, lone pair are going to repulse the most, bonding to bonding are going to repulse the least, and lone to bonding are going to be somewhere in between. Number 15, you got an organic compound containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You've got percentages of carbon and hydrogen, so if you subtract from 100, you'll get the remainder being your oxygen. So then the 54.5% or grams of carbon converts to 4.54 moles. 9.1 grams of hydrogen becomes 9.01 moles of hydrogen, and 36.4 grams of oxygen becomes 2.275 moles. So then dividing all of them by that smallest amount, the 2.275, I come up with two, four, and one moles. You might notice my mistake. I initially uh, had oxygen's mass at 12.01, and that didn't work out so well. So C2H4O would be the correct answer. And B, a 0 0.230 gram sample of A when vaporized had a volume of 0.0785, 95 degrees, 102 kilopascals. What's the relative molecular mass? You can use the ideal gas law for this, and I use PV equals little mrt over big M, and went ahead and plugged in the 0.230 grams. 
I could have used PV equals NRT, and once I had the moles, I could have taken my grams to buy by my moles, and I would have come up with the same relative mass of 87.8 grams per mole. So the molecular formula using your answers from part A and part B, since the um, actual mass was just found to be right around 88 and the mass of the empirical formula is 44, that means I would have to double the empirical formula to C4H8O2. Number 60 wants to know a physical property that is different for isotopes of an element. The mass is the big one, which means the density will be different. Melting point and boiling point will tend to increase. Rate of diffusion will be slower. Those are the common physical properties that an isotope affects. Part B, uh, you've got chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Calculate the relative abundance of each. Well, I know that the average mass is 35.45. I know the percentages have to add up to 100. So I set it up with 35 times x plus 37 times 100 minus x, and then divide by 100. That, uh, for me, that's a little easier because I don't have to deal with the decimals. And that leaves me with 77.5% for x, which was chlorine 35. And then when I subtract from 100, 23.5% being chlorine 37. And number 17, with reference to the types of bonding present in period three elements, so you needed to mention what kind of bond it is, and then you had to also explain the trend that they were talking about. So why Mg has a higher melting point than sodium? Well, they both have metallic bonds, and they have the same energy level, but Mg has a stronger nucleus to hold on to more delocalized electrons in that metallic bond. So... It's a metallic bond, but Mg has a stronger nucleus and more delocalized electrons, which is going to increase the strength of that bond. Why does Si have a very high melting point? Because it can form four covalent bonds into a giant covalent structure, which means there's a lot of bonds to break and it's going to have a much higher melting point. And the other nonmetal elements of period three have low melting points, and that's because they're only forming weak covalent bonds or in the case of argon, no bond at all. So they're going to be very simple molecular compounds with the low um, London dispersion forces holding them together. Number 18 said arrange the following in decreasing order of bond angle, largest one first. So again, sketch them out, and you see that they all have a tetrahedral shape when you look at the electron domains, but NH4 plus has all four uh, domains are bonding sites, so it's equal repulsion, and they're a maximum distance of 109.5 degrees apart in a tetrahedral ar arrangement. At the other end, NH2 has two lone pair, pushing the hydrogens as close together as they're going to get in a tetrahedral domain. And the molecular shape becomes bent with only 105 degrees between them. And then NH3 is a trigonal pyramidal with a bond angle in between and around 107. Number 19, explain why the bonds in silicon uh, tetrachloride are polar, but the molecule is not. The bonds are polar because chlorine has a greater electronegativity. So you had to mention something about electronegativity because that's what makes polar bonds. The molecule is nonpolar because the symmetrical shape allows the polar effects uh, to cancel out. So there is no net dipole on this molecule. 